It doesn't require much discussion to understand the appeal of kaiju media. Fantastical creatures brought to life with a variety of unique and intricate styles, showcasing revolutionary special effects wizardry and incredibly creative visual and character design philosophies. To put it simply, giant monster movies are beloved for a very obvious reason. The monsters. So much so that a common criticism lobbied at kaiju media concerns the other part of these stories, the human perspective and characters. All too often you'll hear critique of a story that the human characters take up too much time that could be better spent focusing on the kaiju. You'll even hear comments that go so far as to suggest an entirely human-free kaiju project as some sort of holy grail idea for the genre. And honestly, this mentality has always kind of rubbed me the wrong way. It's understandable that audiences would find fantasy creatures much more interesting to follow than a normal cast of people, but there's a very bizarre line of thinking with kaiju media, predominantly movies, that usually revolves around a mantra of, it's a lot of fun, once you get past the boring human parts. Recently, Toho's 2023 Godzilla film, Godzilla Minus One, led a lot of people to come to the same conclusion. It's possible to have a good human side to a kaiju story? And to that I say, yeah. It, um, always has been. Since the genre's inception 70 so years ago. Of course, the original 1954 Godzilla is the perennial example that most casual kaiju fans or film-savvy non-fans will point to as an example of this. Godzilla 54 and Minus One are definitely the two reigning champions of the argument that a good human story is possible with a kaiju-focused narrative. There are some that even argue that Minus One would still stand strong as a human story without the inclusion of Godzilla, which I vehemently disagree with, but that's a subject worth discussing in an entirely separate video, maybe. But even though 1954's Godzilla and 2023's Godzilla Minus One are both examples of strong human narratives seamlessly mixing in with powerful kaiju action, the genre is nearly a century old, with hundreds if not thousands of different stories written by different people and featuring themes, archetypes, metaphors, and other storytelling components of varying degrees. This idea that compelling human stories are a rarity in kaiju media is frankly wildly exaggerated and straight up untrue. This video is going to look at a few examples of kaiju films that manage to provide that perfect balance of a strong human and kaiju narrative to great success. To start, I want to take a look at one of the most underrated and overlooked Godzilla films of the franchise's 70 year history, 1984's Godzilla, or The Return of Godzilla as it's called internationally. The first reboot for the character after a nine year hiatus from the silver screen, it takes the more kid focused, superhero ish monster from the 1970s Champion Festival era of Godzilla productions back to a more brooding 1954 inspired tale with an antagonistic Godzilla for the first time in nearly 20 years. This approach also saw a reintroduction of a more serious, politically charged narrative to the series. Not to say that Godzilla films post 1954 were apolitical or anything, but this was probably the most overt since then. Return of Godzilla's central human cast is composed of five protagonists. Ken Tanaka as reporter Goro Maki, Yosuke Natsuki as biophysicist Dr. Hayashida, his assistant Naoko Okamura, played by Yasuko Sawaguchi, her brother Hiroshi, Shin Takuma, and Japanese Prime Minister Mitamira, portrayed by Kaiju Kobayashi. The narrative these characters are a part of focuses on the return of Godzilla, naturally, to Japanese borders after a near 30 year absence. This happens to coincide directly with the ongoing United States-Soviet Union Cold War, and Godzilla's appearance is ripe for the warring nations to use as a litmus test for their nuclear prowess, with a hapless Japan caught in the middle. The Cold War tensions in Return of Godzilla are the film's greatest triumph, especially Keiju Kobayashi's performance as Prime Minister Mitamura. The ideological divide between Japan's peaceful, staunch anti-nuclear weapons stance and the frothing American and Soviet warmongers is at times uncomfortable to witness. This is a nation fully cognizant of the horrors of atomic weaponry fighting tooth and nail against two bully nations, essentially chomping at the bit to use Japan as a playground for their war games. Through an amazingly tense and well-executed scene with all three nations meeting to discuss the plan of action against Godzilla, the US and Soviet Union's true intentions are revealed. Though Godzilla is a clear and present danger, Japan remains firm in its principles with no amount of urgency shaking that foundation. Prime Minister Mitomura surprisingly does not interact directly with the other four protagonists, but that doesn't mean the narratives are separated. Goro's discovery of Hiroshi on the abandoned fishing vessel intermingles with the political world as Hiroshi's identification of Godzilla causes the Japanese government to put the kibosh on the story reaching the public. This censorship of the truth eventually crosses paths with the Cold War tensions as a then unpublicized Godzilla destroys a Soviet nuclear submarine off the coast of Japan. Japan, which the Soviets naturally blame on the Americans. Japan therefore becomes the median between the two nations and reveals Godzilla's existence to ease tensions. But the problem still persists with Godzilla's revelation, as now Japan has what is essentially a target on its back. 
Professor Hayashida, a biophysicist with a personal history with the creature, is then thrust into the unspoken responsibility of finding a way to stop Godzilla before it destroys Japan and causes an all-out nuclear arms race. The return of Godzilla's strong, politically charged narrative is wrought with depth and cultural relevance to its time. It is to the 1980s what the 54 Godzilla was to its time, a contemporary deconstruction of the current global power state. The strength of the film's story is mostly helped by a very strong human cast. Even though Godzilla's rampage sequences are enjoyable to watch, especially with a newly resized Godzilla cast among a Tokyo that now dwarfs him instead of the other way around, the film would not nearly be as impactful or powerful if it wasn't for that contemporary political angle fronted by that strong human cast. Though Though human characters in kaiju films can be extremely effective at sending strongly metaphorical or downright blatant political messages, sometimes a well-written human cast can simply just add to the fun of the movie, or even sometimes overshadow the kaiju focus parts entirely. Two of my favorite Godzilla movies are Godzilla vs. Monster Zero and Godzilla vs. The Sea Monster. Both are late 1960s Showa-era Godzilla productions, heavily focusing on genre picture settings and tropes at the time. Monster Zero is heavily science fiction inspired, with alien invaders and spaceships traveling to faraway planets, while Sea Monster is heavily derived from spy films such as the James Bond series. These two films are part of a rare subsection of Godzilla films where I personally enjoy the human characters way more than any of the monster scenes. Most of this is due to the charismatic nature of the actors involved, especially Akira Takarada and Kumi Mizuno, who star in both pictures. Monster Zero's main cast is one of the most famous in all of kaiju film history. You've got the brilliantly charming 60s macho king, Nick Adams, chewing the scenery even when he's overdubbed in the Japanese version, Yoshio Tsuchiya as the cold and calculating controller of Planet X, Kumi Mizuno as the mysterious femme fatale Miss Namakawa, and Akira Kubo as the lovably dorky inventor Tetsuo, among others. Monster Zero's primary cast fully embraces their roles and gives a fantastic cabal of performances all around. Nick Adams' camaraderie with Akira Takarada is fully apparent on the screen, and Glenn and Fuji make a dynamic duo of protagonists. Yoshio Tsuchiya's Planet X leader is one of the most iconic characters of all kaiju film history, fully embracing the role as a manipulative and intelligent invader. Kumi Mizuno's Miss Namakawa serves as the film's bridge between the worlds of Planet X and Earth as her role in the narrative begins rather inconspicuously before the full extent of her mission is unraveled as the film goes on. Good old Toho regular Akira Kubo plays Tetsuo, the down-on-his-luck inventor, with a great amount of heart. Tetsuo is introduced as somewhat of a foil for the strict Fuji, who disapproves of his sister dating someone like Tetsuo. Tetsuo, who doesn't seem to have a clear path in life. But Tetsuo ends up being one of the most important characters in the entire story and is personally responsible for helping disrupt the Planet X aliens' plans to take over the Earth. And all of this interwoven, planet-hopping, espionage, invasion story was all referenced and mentioned without once even discussing the kaiju element of the film. Yes, Godzilla, Rodan, and King Ghidorah appear in the film, with the latter acting as Planet X's kaiju attack dog, but their presence is merely to serve as sprinkles on this ice cream cake of a film. They're set dressing, meant to enhance the production and showcase some brilliant late 1960s Eiji Tsuburaya-directed tokusatsu glory. That also can be said for Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster as well. The story this time doesn't revolve around international politics and world-ending alien threats, but a group of average, ordinary people who shipwreck on an uncharted island overrun by the Red Bamboo, radical terrorists hell-bent on conquering the world with an array of nuclear weapons and a giant lobster-like kaiju as a pawn. This small group of essentially nobodies must band together with kidnapped natives from Mothra's home of Infant Island to stop the organization's nefarious plans. This was the first Godzilla film directed by Jun Fukuda, who was notable for his works involving the crime and spy genres, which echoes predominantly in his Godzilla series. Series involvements. Sea Monster features this sort of youthful energy rooted in 1960s counterculture and embodied by the primary characters, who are all relatively unknown actors save for Akira Takarada and Kumi Mizuno. Ryota, Nita, and Ichino are three college-age men whose involvement in the narrative stems from a simple dance competition to win a boat, as Ryota is searching for his brother Yada, who was lost at sea. They eventually run afoul of wanted criminal Yoshimura, played by Takarada, who is tricked into sailing along with the trio to search for Yada. Encountering the monstrous Ebira during a typhoon, they're washed ashore on Let Island and subsequently stumble onto the evil red bamboo and an escaped native prisoner named Dio, Kumi Mizuno again. The group survives their time on Lechi Island through a combination of wits and intelligence, and each character provides ample instances of distinct and entertaining personality. Yoshimura is the standout character and probably my favorite role Akira Takarada ever portrayed, a bullish yet sly and crafty criminal whose expertise in the world of crime is a great asset to the group's endeavors. His rapport with the young college-age kids provides some fun interactions. But once again, here we are discussing the strengths of this film, and I've only mentioned one kaiju, and it's not even the series' eponymous character. Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster's human angle is fun, pulpy, and evocative of some of the greater 1960s new wave films. It's genuinely a blast to watch these characters evade the red bamboo and come up 
with clever and inventive ways to sneak past guards and free the enslaved infant islanders. Godzilla's presence in the film is so unintrusive that I doubt you'd be shocked to know that it wasn't originally written with Godzilla in mind, but King Kong, owing to just how malleable and strong Sea Monster's narrative is outside of its monster sequences. So that's three Godzilla productions discussed, along countless others that I didn't even mention. Honestly, this whole video could be filled with discussing strong human narratives purely in the Godzilla franchise, and even though it's the most important and iconic kaiju series of them all, I don't want to convey a message that Godzilla films are the only kaiju media that are capable of having good human characters. There's nothing inherent with the franchise that makes it more adept at having this, except maybe just its massive prominence. But there are definitely non-Godzilla kaiju films out there that have well-written and executed human narratives, especially when it comes to his flying terrapin rival Gamera. I know everyone's expecting this portion of the video to talk about the Heisei Gamera trilogy directed by Shusuke Kaneko, and I will discuss them a little bit, as they are another prime example of this video's topic, but there are simultaneously tons and tons of videos and essays out there discussing these films that I don't think I really have much more to say on the matter that hasn't already been said. Simply put, yes, the Heisei Gamera trilogy are some of the greatest kaiju stories ever produced, and a big part of that is the strength at which writers Kaneko and Kazunori Ito break the human counterparts to the kaiju, especially in the mythological connections between Gamera and Asagi throughout the trilogy. The films excel in visual storytelling and character development, and like I said, have been discussed enough out there on the internet. Just didn't want to forget them here. The one Gamera project I will be talking about more in depth is 2006's Gamera the Brave, the sort of black sheep of the Gamera series. Not due to the film's quality, far from it, it's actually my personal favorite Gamera movie out of them all, but due to the time period in which it was released, the tail end of the so-called millennium era of kaiju history, where the genre received diminishing box office returns and overall was on a general downward trend home in Japan. Gamera the Brave managed what many viewers thought after the Heisei Gamera trilogy's release was impossible, implement the strong character writing and brilliant visual sensibilities of those films with the more child-focused, lighter-toned style of the early Showa Gamera films. The result was one of the most sincere and heartfelt kaiju productions in the genre's history. The tale of a young boy, Toru, whose relationship with an infant Gamera crosses paths with his strained relationship with his widowed father, Kosuke. Toto, the young Gamera, initially begins the film as a small tortoise, but eventually grows to enormous proportions, and Toto begins to fear that he might have to give up his new friend, still reeling from the feelings of loss and abandonment from his mother's passing. The appearance of Zetus, a voracious man-eating kaiju, means Toto will eventually have to combat the monster and take up the mantle of his father as protector of Earth. The film is masterful at establishing the relationships between not just Toru and Toto, but with Toru's friends and especially his father. It eschews the traditional children's film trope of the adult finding out about the magical pet and wanting it gone, to instead having Kosuke actually embrace the existence of Toto, but not out of wanting his son to have a close bond with the creature, but because he had witnessed the original Gamera sacrifice his life to protect his hometown. Kosuke then is actually interestingly portrayed as the one embracing Toto's destiny, while Toto was reluctant to let his closest friend sacrifice sacrifice himself. There's this delicate balance of lighthearted children's fantasy fare, coupled with a very real and terrifying situation that might result in heartbreak that I think the film just so wonderfully pulls off. It's a shame this film didn't receive greater financial recognition and was released during a time when kaiju films weren't really treated fairly, as I think this film could have made an enormous impact had it been released at a better time. One last film I want to look at is one I've seen receive the glut of the anti-human drama argument, for extremely, extremely poor reasons. 2013 Pacific Rim. This is another film that a lot of people have talked about before but I think a vast majority of the discussion surrounding it comes from a good-natured but ultimately backhanded approach of, oh, well, the human parts are alright, but the battles are where it's at, which I think gravely misses the entire point of the movie. Pacific Rim is a story about robots fighting monsters, if you looked at it for about 10 seconds. In reality, it's a film about bonds and connections, of overcoming trauma and establishing yourself in a world of uncertainty. Pacific Rim may have attracted people to theaters with its admittedly amazing and beautiful special effects and predominantly deep world building, but it stayed with its admirers thanks to its insistence on developing more than just how hard a Jaeger can punch a kaiju. Pacific Rim's central protagonists, Raleigh Beckett and Mako Mori, are two people linked by loss. Raleigh with his brother Yancey, and Mako with her parents, both as a result of the film's marauding kaiju. One of Pacific Rim's greatest inventions for its world is the idea idea that Jaeger piloting is not as simple as just strapping into the robot and controlling it with ease. The Jaegers are operated by a cerebral link, which is too much for one person to handle, meaning two pilots must connect for the mech to function. The drift, as it's called, is the act of two people melding minds and memories together to allow for a perfect synchronous connection. Drift compatibility is an important facet of Raleigh's character, as he and his brother shared an extremely strong bond that was nigh impossible to replicate. The search for a new co-pilot for Raleigh is one of the character's central obstacles in the first act, and his meeting with Mako Mori forms the basis for that new bond. But unlike like many other films of this type, Pacific Rim doesn't produce the Mako Raleigh pairing as something inherently romantic. This is a relationship formed from a sharing of grief, of being able to process and overcome those hardships in life in order to mold a better version of yourself. 
This is also apparent in other characters throughout the film, especially Stacker Pentecost, the head of the Jaeger program. Stacker had rescued Mako from the kaiju attack that took her parents and raised her as his own. Pentecost is hesitant to let Mako into the Jaeger pilot trials for fear of losing her, either to the perilous dangers that piloting a Jaeger instills, or to the threat of vengeance clouding her from making proper judgments. Many viewers would be surprised to find out that the majority of the screen time in Pacific Rim is not focused on Monster v Mecha combat, but on developing these characters in order to make their eventual leaps into battle much more exciting and tense. It also helps that the visual design philosophies of the Jaegers help to embody their human pilots and vice versa. Gypsy Danger, Raleigh and Mako's Jaeger, is built like that of a gunslinger or samurai with a wide gait and slow, deliberate movements, echoing Raleigh and Mako's status as lone souls coming together. Striker Eureka is piloted by father and son Chuck and Herc Hansen, the old clashing with the new, as Stryker is the latest Jaeger constructed, and also the last of an archaic program intent on being shut down by ignorant government officials. Even the film's non-Jaeger-associated characters receive prominent and significant attention. The squabbling pair of kaiju scientists, Newt Geisler and Herman Gottlieb, support the film's kaiju-oriented angle and even embody their respective approaches to the scientific method. Newt is very punkish, bold, and abrasive, associating his kaiju research career with that of a rock star. Herman is very by-the-book, an old-school type of scholar who believes in logic and numbers above fringe and hypothetical. The two are at odds throughout most of the film, only coming together at the very end to merge their two pathways into a single, unified road to victory. Like I said earlier, Pacific Rim didn't just land purely on its technical brilliance, but from its genuine and emotionally charged writing, providing the kaiju genre with some of its most eloquently executed character relationships since its inception. Okay, so we've discussed the what, what constitutes a compelling human narrative in a kaiju project, but it all comes back to the why. Why does it matter that a kaiju story has a good human angle? Well, a kaiju is inherently defined by its juxtaposition to humanity. Like, you can't really call something a giant monster without understanding what it's giant to, right? But besides that size element, kaiju almost always have this sort of folly of man approach to their stories. Even in something that eschews explicit political or social messaging, kaiju almost always act as a natural counterbalance against humanity. And to be blunt, having a good human side is just simply intelligent storytelling. If you're going to be spending the majority of the story's time with these human characters, it's pretty obvious that they should be written in an interesting and enjoyable manner. Kaiju media generally has a pretty difficult task from the get-go, balancing a compelling narrative interlocked with scenes of rampant monster action. It's definitely not easy to make a great kaiju movie, all things considered. Even though I disagree with the notion that kaiju media inherently features a throwaway human angle, there's a lot of examples where it's hard to argue that. Films like The X from Outer Space, Gamma vs. Zigra, Rebirth of Mothra all feature middling to pretty terrible human elements, and I think these types of movies, coupled with the genre's limited distribution in Western countries and frequent appearances as part of comedy programs like Mystery Science Theater, do a lot more visible damage to its reputation than expected. Some people will remember a truly great kaiju production, but it's also just as likely that people will remember a god-awful one. But despite this, I still think the kaiju genre is pretty overly scrutinized, especially by non-fans or hardcore film buffs. I do think it's pretty understandable that people will remember the fantastical creatures and monsters over the less monstrous human drama, especially given the former is what the genre is built on. But don't let the flashy monster battles overpower you. Sometimes there's genuinely fantastic stuff in these films beyond whatever Godzilla and company are doing in the third act. I think too often we let well-done spectacle take control of the narrative surrounding genre film critique, and I hope in the future people will take a look at some of the films I've mentioned here as well as other kaiju media and try to engage with it beyond the superficial fantasy of the whole affair. So no, Godzilla Minus One is not the first kaiju film since 1954 to feature a compelling human narrative. It's just the next in a long, long history of there being more to this genre than meets the eye.